seems like it was a year ago. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking, speaking of a year ago, anybody here for the first time? Uh, uh, yes, I am. Annie? Uh, uh, Robert Hauser. Hauser? Hauser? Uh, yeah, I just joined um, a month ago. Excellent. Thank you. I, that's my wife's name. She put this together for me. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, technical assistance there, right? Yes, right. Yeah, well, yes, definitely needed. Yes. <laughs> that was welcome. Kate, Hello, did you Kate. say you were new also? Yeah. Hey there, Kate. Kate, where are you coming in from? Uh, I'm coming in from Manchester. All right. Thanks. Excellent. All right. Well, we're going to give this like 15 more seconds, everybody, and then we're going to roll with it. Um, Elmer, excellent. First time. <laughs> it's Emer, but thank you. Yes. Oh, Emer. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. Emer. That's a, that's a great way to call you Elmer. Sorry. Welcome, oh, Emer. Yeah. Not, the, not the last. <laughs> Good to see you, Emer. You're like, yeah, I got your Elmer here, buddy. Okay. Hang on. All right, everybody, um, we're, we're right at 7.32, so let's get going. So welcome to the first meeting of 2021 of the New Hampshire Astronomical Society. Uh, I'm Wyatt Davis, I'm serving as president for 2021. I've been an Astronomical Society member for three years. Uh, my wife, Janet, and I came here from Dallas, Texas, and we live on the seacoast and love living in New Hampshire. Uh, and I'm an I'm a avid star watcher lifelong and have been very focused on this for about the last 10 years. So I'm very excited to serve in this capacity. I just wanna point out to everybody that the mission of the Astronomical Society is to advance amateur astronomy. Uh, and I wanna make sure, especially for those of you who are new and joining, and maybe even for some of the members of the public as this is a public meeting, uh, that there are many facets of astronomy and certainly among our membership, we have people who are uh, scientists who advance astronomy through scientific exploration and discovery and research. And we also have members who are avid stargazers who just love to look at the stars, love to be out and explore. And we have some that are both. So I wanna encourage you to understand us as a group of avid astronomers with all those definitions included. Um, we're hoping to have a wonderful year this year. We've already got some amazing speakers lined up. I hope for those of you who are guests, you will continue to join us and feel free uh, to come to these open monthly meetings. I hope you'll consider joining us after you see what we're up to here. Let me really quickly um, share with you the agenda for tonight, and then we will proceed and move into our speaker. So here in a second, I'm going to ask a couple of our newer members uh, to maybe introduce themselves. And we're not trying to cover everybody because we actually have quite a few new speak, uh, members, which is wonderful. I'm going to hope that we'll do this every meeting, though, and have a few people uh, come in and in just introduce themselves. We want to get people introduced to each other around the state, around the country. And so we'll just ask a couple of our newer members to do that. We have John Blackwell from yes, the Banjo Observatory at Phillips Exeter Academy to speak Thank to us you. tonight on Sidereus Nuncius, Galileo's message to the masses, which is just a fabulous topic. Uh, I'm gonna facilitate a question and answer with John immediately after his presentation. And when we get there, you can put questions in the chat or you can just raise your hand and we'll, we'll go through those. And then we're actually going to do Galileo's deep sky observing list. Uh, direct from Sidereus Nuncius, and I'll take you through an observing guide that everybody can use tonight. Tonight's going to be a beautiful night uh, to get out and see these or any time in January or this, uh, this winter time. So we'll do that. Um, I'm going to take you through resources for aspiring visual astronomers. And again, for the newer members of our club, for those who may be uh, closer to beginners, and just for our general guests, we want you to know what the Astronomical Society offers to help you go out explore the stars and begin your own journey in astronomy. So we'll cover some of those topics. And then I'm also gonna share with you some upcoming events uh, that I think you're gonna find really interesting and hope you'll choose to join. And then finally, we'll move to club business. And for those of you who are joining us as guests, please feel free to stay uh, and hear what we've got going on. But this is a chance to talk about the club, its priorities, our financials, uh, our, our Young's Farm observing site in uh, southwestern New Hampshire and some of the things that are happening there and for members to just discuss what's happening. So we hope that everyone will choose to stay for that work as well. So I'm going to take us back up to the top um, and I'm going to look, if I may, and just ask, 
I know one person I do want to ask uh, that uh, she introduce herself, and that would be Ellen Reed. Um, Ellen, do you mind jumping in? Let's see, Ellen, I can't hear you. Sorry about uh, that. She had, oh, she's back. She had in the chat yeah. that she was having trouble with her audio. Good. I didn't think I was going to be the first order of business. So I guess I'll just real quick, just kind of just give my background. My name is Ellen Reed. <laughs> I am originally from Memphis, but uh, I moved to Newmarket, New Hampshire 11 years ago. I am in my third term as a New Hampshire state representative. Um, and, you know, my life kind of took this this kind of left turn because when I was an undergrad, I, you know, I was all about, I was a molecular and cellular biology major, you know, loved math. Um, and then, you know, I kind of thought science was gonna save the world and indeed it should. Um, and that, that was like early 2000s. Um, and I kind of got into politics because I was realizing that the thing that was holding us up from saving the world wasn't science, it was political will. And so I kind of got involved in that, um, moved to New Hampshire and, uh, and got involved. And so I kind of went into this whole humanities direction and got my master's in, in policy. And in the last couple of years, kind of wished I had not gone so far away, gotten so far away from the sciences. And so I got involved. Uh, it was actually another member, Rick Eames, who reached out to me on political matters and wanted me to sponsor a bill to make the upcoming solar total solar eclipse day a holiday, which I did and would have passed had, had not COVID happened. Um, but uh, that's how I got, you know, learned about you and I had heard about the, the library loan program. And um, so I got involved a, about a year and a half ago and the club has just been amazing. There's just been so many generous members who have shared equipment with me, shared their time and knowledge with me. And I, I just think that everybody's been awesome. And I wish all the political organizations I work with were half as organized as you are. So that's kind of my story in a nutshell. Ellen, thank you so much. Uh, I'm asking Greg, if you wouldn't mind to uh, make a quick introduction. Certainly, thanks Wyatt. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually returning to the club. I was a member many years ago when my daughter was in middle school and um, I had bought her a scope, which is sitting about six feet from me right now still, um, and got her involved a little bit. And, and then we all got busy, my career took off and we had two more children and, and I dropped out of the club and uh, now we're empty nesters and um, I'm nearing retirement and I'm looking forward to uh, getting into astronomy for real. And uh, I have a scope and a mount and a bunch of things way on back order. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that, uh, you know, having those come in. And in the meantime, I've been watching every YouTube that Ed Ting and others have made uh, uh, to, you know, uh, school myself a little bit. And um, outside of astronomy, I'm a civil engineer. I live in Concord. Our office is in Bedford, although I haven't been there for a year, almost. Um, and uh, I... I'm an avid bicyclist. I actually, through my career, have been able to do a lot of um, bike path design, trail design, rail trail design, all across New England. Uh, and I'm also a bike advocate. I'm the vice president of the Bike Walk Alliance of New Hampshire, which is our statewide advocacy group. Uh, I'm also on two committees in Concord, Transportation Committee and another. Uh, stay kind of busy, uh, but I'm looking forward to uh, you know, joining you all and learning from all of you and consider myself a novice and hoping to get into astrophotography um, and um, hoping that we don't schedule any more of these meetings on the clearest moonlight, uh, moonless <laughs> night. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, it's okay, it's cold out, so. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Greg. I Greg wanted to second that motion. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to ask for one more introduction tonight, but I'm looking across the gallery and I see a lot of new faces, some of whom I've had the chance to meet over the last four weeks. And so, as I said at the opening, next month, let's continue doing the introductions. Um, and again, one of the priorities for this year is for us to do more of this, to meet each other, to connect throughout the state, throughout the country, and to do astronomy together. But may I ask for one more simply because she's going to be our presenter next month, and that's Sally Jansen. So Sally, please. Um, hi. Um, 
I'm a retired teacher recently, and um, I live at Livermore Falls, which is in Canton. And so your GPS would take you right to my driveway, which is a private driveway. They should be taking you to the, just down a piece on the road. And my family created for me, I don't know if you can see this. <laughs> yes. I love my space. So I love my home since I've had to conquer down because I'm of that age that COVID is, you know, serious with it. And I love space and I love teaching. I taught middle school and some high school and elementary school. And I've been fortunate in my career to be involved with as a educator fellow Terrible. in four different missions. Okay. Be the messenger mission that, that orbited Mercury, uh, the New Horizons mission, which I uh, was part of the flyby and I was there seeing it all for the first time, which is really amazing. All of it was amazing. The MAVEN mission, which is currently orbiting Mars, analyzing the um, atmosphere, and then the Chandra Observatory. Um, so, and I'm a solar system ambassador, which means I get training and I can do presentations and we'll be looking forward to um, the rover Perseverance, which is going to be landing um, on Mars in February. So that's a big deal. And we can all get involved with it, with the virtual watching of it. And there's, um, it's very exciting. So. Awesome. Sally, thank you. Um, and I have to admit, Sally is a new member and an accidental discovery. So I'm so glad we got to meet and the timing is perfect for this. So uh, looking forward to your presentation next month. All right, everybody, we're gonna shift gears now and go to our featured speaker. Uh, and I wanna to introduce to you, for those of you who haven't met him, many of you do know John, uh, but John Blackwell, who is the director of the Phillips Exeter Academy Granger Observatory, where he teaches astronomy, physics, and epistemology during the school year. In his off times, he is an astronomy research scientist with primary interests in cataclysmic variable stars, accretion systems and galaxy evolution through the study of active galactic nuclei. Close to home, John is now working with UNH and other local schools in the construction of, of a magnetometer network to study geomagnetic phenomena related to solar activity, uh, the space weather underground. So ladies and gentlemen, without any further delay, Mr. John Blackwell, John, take it away. Oh my goodness, hello, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Wyatt, thank you um, for the introduction. It's it's really good to see everybody. The people that I do know, it's been a long time. I haven't, um, I haven't pre presented, I think, for a few years to the NHS, and it seems like forever uh, due to the COVID nature of things um, since we've had any time together in general, except for that comet, which when was that? Back in July or August. Let me share my screen and uh, get started here. As, um, as Wyatt had mentioned earlier, I am an avid amateur astronomer and professional astronomer and educator. And let's see here, get my presenter view going and then share a portion of my screen and here we go. Okay, give me a nod if you guys see um, a slide or two. Good, okay, fantastic. Let's get this back to the beginning where, where things should be. I don't know why it didn't start from the beginning, but we'll bring it back there and be happy with all the technological oddities that uh, this software gives us. Um, and to the new people here at NHS, thanks for joining us tonight. That's fantastic to have uh, new people here and some, some friends that I actually work with, uh, both uh, faculty and staff and students are actually on this call today. So welcome everybody, that's fantastic. I was invited by Wyatt to uh, to take the the very first talk of the of the 2021 year. Mind bending. It was only a couple of weeks ago, so I really um, I threw this together. Hopefully, it'll work. I think it will. Um, the topic is Sidereus Nuncius, or if you're into classical Latin, Nuncius. Uh, I will I will remain with Nuncius because it is the more familiar pronunciation, and uh, the topic is really about a message for the masses, which. Um, I'll get into as, as uh, we move forward here. Um, wow, 
none of the controls work the way they normally do. Okay, so the focus of this talk, as uh, as we stated, is is Sidiris Nuncius. It's a short 57 page um, piece of writing by Galileo Galilei, which he released in 1610. Um, greatly involved in many other aspects of of his life. He was he was so. Um, so entrenched with doing science and mathematics and public um, expertise, getting information out to people, uh, that Sidereus Nuncius was a logical outcome of some rather intriguing and awesome observations that he had been doing uh, literally just months before. The same, the same relative time span starting in 1609 um, and getting to 1610. Uh, he, he literally had three months before he put this book out. So it was really quick. Um, so while this is, text is greatly involved in many aspects of his life, I'm only gonna be talking um, about that and tangentially about the rest of the stuff that kind of intersected with Sidereus Nuncius. Um, there is a lot going on in terms of the politics of the uh, various Italian cultures at the time, the city-states of, of uh, Italy, but also about the religious implications of Sidereus Nuncius. But actually there's, there's more of that with some of his later writings, which I'll get into a little bit as we get through the talk. And there are also tons of other resources of information, including uh, additional writings by Galileo. We have tons of his writings. Unfortunately, none of his letters to his daughter, um, which, which were burned, unfortunately, but uh, all of her writings to him, uh, he saved. We also have many of his lab notebooks um, all of these are available publicly and in, in book form, and you should definitely investigate those if I, I pique some interest throughout the night. Um, and I'll make note of some of the more important ones at the end of the talk uh, before moving on. When it comes to studying history of astronomy, that is not, that is not my forte. Um, this is actually more of a hobby side of my life. Um, it's, it's hard not to be into some form of history when studying astronomy. Just looking up at the stars at the nighttime, you see stars are labeled with the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, et cetera, all the way through omega. You see names that have been uh, changed over the centuries from Arabic, ancient Arabic and Latin uh, for many of the constellations, Greek and Latin. Um, it's hard not to get involved with the mythology and the curiosity of where those names came from but certainly many of the things that are even in the more modern Western culture, things like the naming of Jupiter's moons, Io, Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto, uh, harken back to historic events in, uh, in our past, not too many hundreds of years ago. Uh, my personal journey in this is, is starting uh, to get really heated at this point in my life. Uh, being a research astronomer and into astronomy for decades, now, my, uh, my, my curiosity has leaned more into figuring out where all this came from. And you can see this picture here um, off the mountain of Ben Nevis. If you look carefully toward the center, just down a little bit is a yellow dot. That's my tent. And in the grand scheme of things, in the size and scale of this universe, that tent is pretty insignificant. And that's pretty much how much I know about the history of astronomy. There is so much we don't know and there's so much more to learn. So I uh, send a message to you to keep, keep your eyes and ears open, keep reading, keep learning, uh, find out where this stuff comes from. It's fascinating and, and very intriguing. Um, so we'll just get started. But first, a really interesting picture here. Um, it was 2017, uh, a friend of mine and coworker uh, Emer Page, colleague of mine, and Emer, you're on this call. Hello. Uh, had this wonderful opportunity while we were working down in Cambridge back in 2017 with a group of students um, to go wander through some of the Harvard Library collections. They have a museum there, and you can go in and look at some of the stuff that they've laid out. You know, beautiful um, handwritten letters by people like Sylvia Plath and 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 whatnot, and and. While we were exiting, we're actually leaving the exhibit, I noticed that there's this little micro turnstile of postcards, so typical of like museum scenarios. You can pick one up and buy it for like 50 cents or whatever. And on that turnstile was a picture that I recognized as being Galileo's 
uh, sketch of, of the moon. And uh, that was pretty cool, I thought. So I picked it up and I looked at it and said, oh, that's a really neat postcard. Maybe I'll buy one, you know, send it to somebody. And I flipped it over and on the bottom left, it said, um, sketch of moon by Galileo Galilei, 1609, da, 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 Harvard collection. And I almost died. I just almost died at that. Seeing that it was in the Harvard collection was something I did not expect to happen. It was mind bending. And I turned around with Emer, pointed, pointed to Emer and said, uh, 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 Harvard collection and wa walked back to the, the person who was at the entrance, who was both a guard and an informer and a receptionist. And I said, in your collection, how do I see this? And they said, well, uh, it, the, the collections are all through that door, but it's locked and you need to get a special ID card. And I'm sure they'll set you up with one if you go to the main library on campus and fill out a bunch of forms. So that's where we went, like bup, 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 running as fast as humanely possible to the other side of the campus. And we filled out forms, got our photos taken, provided ID, explained that we, we were educators and madly in love with uh, people like Shakespeare and Galileo and boom, and off we went. And so uh, Emer Page gets a copy of the 1623 first folio of William Shakespeare, which is on the left photograph top. And underneath it is a 1610 first edition of Sidereus Nuncius by Galileo Galilei. And you'll notice that we're not wearing uh, gloves. The, the actual Harvard Library does not wish people to wear gloves because it, they have found that it causes more damage to the texts than just using clean hands. Kind of mind bending to be holding 400 year old texts. You can smell them, feel them and flip the pages with your bare fingers. Um, and probably even more interestingly, uh, these two texts may have been together on the same table, maybe just for the very first time in 400 years side by side on the table. So we had to, we had to introduce the two in some ways like Galileo Shakespeare, Shakespeare, Galileo. Pretty, uh, pretty amazing opportunity. And that really sparked my, my interest a little bit more. Um, so blossoming interest, Galileo Galilei, an interesting fellow, this guy. Um, one of six children uh, to a rather large family. Vincenzo Galilei was his dad, he was a musician. Uh, and if R.P. Hale was here, we could, uh, I don't know, R.P., if you're there, say hello. Um, he was a lutenist. He played the lute and was rather uh, famous in his, in his region of Pisa and then to Florence. Uh, Galileo, born in 1564, moved to Florence as a, a young, young boy. Um, and was, everybody immediately kind of became aware of his mathematical prowess. He was a very intelligent lad, liked to play with things, get dirty, build scientific experiments, not even calling them scientific experiments. He was into natural phenomena and understanding how that worked. Um, but his dad really wasn't so much into that. Uh, he wanted Galileo um, to heed the calling of being the eldest son in the club and uh, start making money because back then it was, it was important that the firstborn son provide the dowries for the younger daughters. Uh, so he had some business to attend to, i.e. making money. So he was sent to Pisa, also Tuscany, uh, to become a medical physician, uh, which after a few years he did not succeed at. He was much too interested in mathematics. Uh, fine, okay. Um, so he comes back home uh, to Florence and seeks work and he starts tutoring people in mathematics. Um, and at the ripe age of 25 years old, publishes his first text in mathematics and becomes an overnight hit. Everybody loves this guy. Um, pretty, pretty amazingly famous at that point to which he's invited to become a mathematics professor at the University of Pisa. Cool, so now he's got a job. But this guy, Galileo, is pretty full of himself. He's pretty arrogant. He's, uh, he's got an ego, uh, but he was usually right. One of those types of people that uh, you know, it's just like you don't want to argue with him because eventually he's just gonna he's just gonna win the win the uh, the discussion. Um, he becomes that uh, that math professor later in Padua after being kind of uh, unceremoniously removed from being a professor at Pisa. So after having a few arguments at Pisa, he becomes a mathematics professor in uh, competing uh, Florence in Padua in 1592. So now he's got a, another job. He's still a mathematics professor, well-known, 
And at this point, Grand Duke Ferdinand de Medici uh, has a son uh, who would be uh, later very famous, uh, Cosimo de Medici, uh, later again, the new Grand Duke. Um, but this, this lad needs an education in mathematics. So he hires Galileo Galilei to be his math tutor for his son. And at that point, um, he's also invited to become a de Medici court member. So now he's, he's hanging around with the, the, the high and mighty, the powerful, um, which is really quite interesting. Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that was like uh, in, in that society at the time coming on here in a, in a few minutes. Um, an interesting guy. So as we also know, he was also one of the first people to act and perform uh, what we call a more modern science, uh, science in a more ma modern manner. And there's a reason uh, for that. He was curious in the reality of things that he could observe that were that were not exactly in alignment with the beliefs at the time. Um, as many of you know, uh, back then there was an awful lot of uh, there was a lot of uh, friction, I guess, between uh, what people were taught. Uh, as being real and and what reality really was. And people were pretty good with just kind of hanging in there with what they were told. And, you know, it's like, okay, you know, great. The earth is at the center of, well, everything, the universe. Um, this stems way back. This goes back to the Aristotelian uh, view of the universe, uh, that the earth is at the center of everything. And uh, based on this axiomic uh, thinking, that is using uh, reason and logic and discussion and argument to arrive at truth. And I put that in quotes, um, the earth was considered at the center of the universe. After all, if it was moving, everything would just fall off. My, my cat included would just like fall off. Uh, the oceans would go off to one side and that would be bad. Um, but surrounding the earth were more perfect things, uh, all things orbiting in perfect circles. Um, all those objects out there like the moon and the sun were crystalline spheres of perfection. Anything that looked a little bit untidy on the surface of the moon, um, you know, the little darker gray areas on there, those were, those were below the surface of the crystalline spheres. And then even more remote, the planetas, the things that were moving in the night sky orbited the earth in circular motion. And beyond that, the stars on the firmament, on a crystalline sphere of perfection, kind of spinning around the earth. Fascinating, but incongruent with what people were observing. All one has to do, of course, is go observe Mars and watch it over the course of a year, and you can see retrograde and prograde motion, which created all sorts of issues when trying to predict where Mars would be at a given moment in time. Interesting problem, interesting problem. Who do we have to thank for all this? Well, you can, you can thank Aristotle, but it was really, you know, this is way after Aristotle's time. Well, you can also thank Cicero, Cicero, and, and the fact that he wrote everything that Aristotle knew about. He wrote a lot about Aristotle. He loved him. And then you can thank uh, Thomas Aquinas, a very famous Dominican priest who brought that all back to the religious foreground of the time of Galileo and beyond. So what about that Copernican system? What happened with Copernicus, who was decades before Galileo? You're looking at 1543, and on his deathbed, Copernicus had published um, the, this treatise on how the sun was really at the center of the solar system, and that everything orbited it, and everything that we observed in the sky could be easily explained by having the sun at the center of the solar system. Well, it's great mathematically, so everybody was allowed to use that system in a form of mathematics, but don't you dare think about using it as a method of explaining reality. Interesting, sorry Ptolemy, all of those epicyclic cycles and circles and circles within circles don't work too well, but, but there you have it. Let's look at a, a wider perspective before we get into the text, a, a historical timeline 15, I'm sorry, 1451, we're looking at Nicholas de Cusa of Italy, who started to make these spectacles, glasses, for those people who are going blind from uh, doing illuminated manuscripts and trying to write um, 
with quill pens, usually by candlelight and late into the nighttime, uh, had invented spectacles. And even prior to that, people had been using uh, glass hemispheres placed over written material to read, and it acted as a, a magnifying lens of sorts. So optics were definitely around. In fact, optical stuff like spheres, glass spheres, had been around since ancient Greek times. Um, but there's no evidence of the telescope coming into uh, use, particularly in, in the Western cultures, until about 1608, uh, 2nd of October, a rather famous day because this guy Hans Lipperhe um, tried to patent one. And the Hague said, no, um, not, not good. Uh, your instrument devised by you has been kind of showing up on the streets lately. In fact, another person tried to patent uh, a similar design literally a couple days later. Uh, this thing, this idea of holding lenses up against each other and using them to, to look through um, was starting to become a big deal. Uh, people knew about it. Um, it was starting to travel through Europe. It, was, it had arrived at Paris at one point uh, by late 1608 and a person was giving them away um, to people in, 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 in big houses, the wealthy, as uh, toys, uh, as keepsakes. But they were very weak. They were made out of, out of both positive and negative um, spectacle lenses. And so the magnification was usually really poor, two times, maybe three times magnification. And there was a student of Galileo who at one point had written Galileo saying, you know, there's this really interesting device in Paris that I think you should see. Um, and he described it in quite some detail. Uh, so Galileo um, was kind of curious. He said, oh, that's interesting. But, but in the letter it says, well, nobody's really impressed. I mean, they hold this thing up to their eyes and they may see something, but it doesn't look all that much bigger um, than it is in reality. It's kind of a novelty, nothing to make a big deal about. But Galileo got on this being the tinkerer and uh, he started making his own lenses, uh, which is really cool. And by the time he was done, he had built um, two refractors, one of 10 times magnification and later one of 20 times magnification, which um, then led him to build one of 30 times magnification. We'll get into all that in just a few moments. Um, by 1609, he was using them to look at the sky. By 1610 in January, he was, he was making his first astronomical observations and putting those into notebooks. Um, and by uh, the time, a day later, 8th January, 1610, uh, Simon Marius was also observing the very same moons of Jupiter just a day later after Galileo. Uh, so definitely the telescope was out and about. Um, so by 13 March, 1610, literally from January to March of that year, Sidereus Nuncius was printed for the first time. It was a rushed printing. Um, and he did it again in 1653, put out another print of it, which was fascinating. Um, by 1610, uh, later in the year after Sidereus Nuncius was printed, he had observed Saturn's rings. He didn't have a clue what they were. They didn't look like rings with his 30 times magnification telescope, which had horrendous chromatic aberration. Um, it looked more like uh, kind of like an oval, maybe flying saucery kind of thing. At one point he describes them as handles or perhaps moons, but not quite sure. Um, it wasn't until Kristen Huygens in 1655, decades later, had applied a longer focal length telescope and noticed that these things were indeed uh, separate from the planet. Um, and that would make sense. I mean, NASA named a probe, the Huygens probe for a, a reason um, to go out there and observe them. And, and again, later in 1610, Galileo keeps at it. He's looking at the phases of Venus and Mercury. He's looking um, at sunspots. Don't do this, just don't do this. Uh, he took uh, his lenses, his objective lenses, and he, he put them into, uh, a candle to collect lamp black and carbon soot on his lenses as a filter. And uh, he would look at the sun and, and measure sunspots. And there were many letters written back and forth with royalty about uh, these sunspots, which seemed to kind of walk across the surface of the sun. Um, by the way, to dispel rumors, uh, Galileo did not go blind by looking at the sun through his telescope. Um, even though you think he would, having done that, 
uh, he actually had glaucoma and other serious medical issues, which caused him to go blind later in life. So there is that, uh, just dispelling that myth, um, which was one that I had learned many years ago. Like he looked at the sun and went blind doing it. Um, not necessarily true. Um, the part that's really cool was in 1612. So two years later, after, after all this stuff in Sidereus Nuncius is printed, um, he actually made in his notebooks references to a, a, a new planeta, um, Neptune, it ended up being. He didn't have a name for it at the time, but he did observe it and precisely labeled its location. And he watched it for well over a month. Um, interestingly, he didn't have the ability to resolve it into a disk. He didn't have the magnification necessary, but he does note its color and he does note its planetary motion. I, I find that uh, superb. Yeah, just fantastic. Wow. Wow. Little known stuff, right? This is a cool thing. This, this is Europe at about that time. This is slightly earlier, like 1600-ish. Uh, so 10 years before Sidereus Nuncius. But it gives you a perspective as to what's happening in terms of, of Europe and uh, Western Asia. You can see the Sardom of Russia is, uh, is hanging that out over there, goes all the way up to Poland. You get the Commonwealth of, the, of Poland and Lithuania. Uh, and then it starts breaking into smaller organizations and, and duchies and city-states, Moldavia, um, Wallachia, the Ottoman Empire sweeping through much of the region had been pushed back. Major wars had pushed them back. Uh, the Austrian monarchy, a good portion of Europe there, as is uh, the Kingdom of France, Spain, and then the Kingdom of England, and then lots of city-states, new republics, and small kingdoms ranging from Sweden and Denmark all the way down to Italy. Italy was not yet a unified country. It was a group of city-states, and we'll be talking mostly about Venice and um, Florence and Tuscany, the major parts where uh, Galileo had been hanging out. To the book. The title. I mean, you can't even get past the first page without there being some kind of like mystery, right? So Sidereus Nuncius, the title is, is interesting because when Galileo was writing, and I, I was about to say emailing, <laughs> when he was writing letters to the person who was going to print Sidereus Nuncius at the printer, um, he originally called it the astronomical message, uh, the aviso astronomico. Um, it was not meant to be the starry message at that point. It was supposed to be the astronomical message, kind of like an announcement to people. Um, and then when he was uh, just discussing with the governing body of Venice uh, permission to get it printed, this would be the Council of Ten. Um, he had called it the Astronomica Denuntiatio Ad Astrologos, or the Astronomical Announcements to Students of the Heavens. Whew, long title. Um, He's aiming this at uh, astronomers, the people who are naturalists who are looking up at the sky. Um, but as, as it got started printing, he was then calling it the Astronomicus Nuncius. Okay, the uh, maybe something having to do with astronomy message or, or notice or something. But literally, as they're starting to print the final pages, which include most of the artwork and whatnot, the title page is the last page be, to be printed here. Um, and he had decided to name it, to name it Sidereus Nuncius. Uh, he had changed his mind at the last moment. Nuncius can mean message, it can mean messenger. It's a difficult translation to us. Um, but interestingly, uh, a contemporary of Galileo, and I think you probably all know his name, his name was Johannes Kepler, um, had translated uh, Nuncius to mean uh, messenger. And it stuck from that point on. So that was in, in uh, Kepler's book, Dissertatio Cum Nuncio Siderio. So it stuck. It's now called the starry messenger, not so much the starry message, which I'll let you decide whether it makes more or less sense. But what's telling also about this front page is what it says. Let's translate this quickly. I will read this for you. You can read the, the, the new Latin on the right. Um, unfolding great and very wonderful sights and displaying to gaze of everyone, but especially philosophers and astronomers, the things that were observed by Galileo Galilei, all in capitals, 
Florentine patrician and public mathematician of the University of Padua, with the help of a spyglass lately devised by him about the face of the moon, countless fixed stars, the Milky Way, nebulous stars, but especially about four planets flying around the star of Jupiter at unequal intervals and periods with wonderful swiftness, which unknown by anyone until this day, the first author detected recently and decided to name Medicean stars. What a great opening, fantastic. So much going on in there. But I think the most interesting word is the word devised of a spyglass lately devised by him. The word is reperti in New Latin, meaning invented or devised. Take your pick. Again, Galileo using literature, or using words, using writing to perhaps sway the readers to think that he is much more than what he appears. Maybe he's trying to convince people that he invented the telescope. The jury's still out on that but we'll see. What can you expect to find in this, this 56, 57 pages of text? It's actually really cool. Um, and you might actually have written much of this stuff yourself as a, an astronomer working with a small telescope in your yard or at your observatory or on trips, um, lunar observations. He's looking at the moon, the moons of Jupiter. He's observing the moons of Jupiter the complexity of the stars in the Milky Way and in famous nebulous regions, which I put quotes around. Um, there's also a little bit of politics. Um, that's a, a misspelling. Uh, this is an excellent example of very early grant writing, which I will explain shortly. But first, you need a telescope, which he describes in great detail. And this is not his drawing, obviously. This is a much more modern representation of a traditional Galilean telescope. Um, it has a plano convex, a positive lens. So a magnifying lens for the objective on the left-hand side here. This particular drawing shows two lenses stacked side by side for the equivalent effect. Yeah, don't worry. His was a single piece of glass. Um, it had a focal length of about this, nothing splendid. You're, you're talking maybe half a meter at best for one of his larger telescopes. Um, and then it has a concave uh, negative lens as his eyepiece, which is an interesting choice. Most observers nowadays use positive lenses that magnify the real image being created by the objective. In this case, um, Galileo is using this to look at things that are far away, mostly uh, way out there at, at uh, infinity. Uh, and, and those objects would have a dimension of Y over here. That would be the object out at infinity that uh, Galileo's telescope is looking at. What's happening here is that the negative lens is placed into the uh, diminishing light cone of the primary of the objective. And when it does that, it creates a virtual image, not a real image, but a virtual image of the object being looked at. And if you place that negative lens at just the right distance, you can actually create a slight magnification, which is Y double prime here. Um, and that appears to be at infinity. So it's an interesting telescope to use. Images are right side up, they're virtual and slightly larger than in real life. And they're focused out at infinity. That's a fascinating design, not typical for what you and I are used to using um, by today's standards. But it was interesting. Um, after building a 20 times magnification and then a 30 times magnification, he, he came up on an idea and he said, you know what? I'm going to bring this to the Venetian Senate and uh, show them that this thing has military capability in the hopes of like garnering higher wages and getting my name out there a little bit more. So he does that. He brings it to the Venetian Senate and he brings them to the top of a tower that overlooks the ocean and they look at sailing ships and they are convinced like that. This thing has a huge uh, power to give them a military advantage over seeing enemy ships or friendly ships coming in to tell how many people, uh, what country they're from, whether they're friend or foe, um, very important discovery. So Galileo being smart gives them this device and tells them how to make it. Um, and they doubled his wages at the University of Padua. 
They literally give him higher wages. They also give him lifetime tenure at the, at the university. Initially, he's feeling fantastic about this. Later records show that he was a little bit displeased with the fact that he had signed a contract that said, well, once you get this raise, you're not ever getting another raise. Oops, maybe not the best negotiation, but, but there you have it. Uh, the telescope is now in his possession and he's now uh, figuring out how to make it a better instrument. Um, by the time he's finishing off writing Sidereus Nuncius, he puts a small cardboard uh, disc as a mask in the front of it uh, to help uh, decrease its diameter, increase its focal length, and reduce some of the rather annoying chromatic aberration that he has there um, to some positive effect, but it also diminishes the amount of photons getting through the telescope uh, to his eyes. Moving forward, he looks at the moon. This is some of the coolest stuff you'll ever see. He looks at the moon and he looks at it over the course of its full lunation through a full synodic period. And he notices that uh, there are mountains, um, notably things like this. If you Can you guys see my mouse? Somebody say yes or no. Yes. yes. Great, thank you. Um, he can see that there are mountain peaks that are illuminated by sunlight, the sun coming from the right-hand side here, that there are mountain peaks illuminated from the right-hand side, even though they are on the dark side of the moon. Fascinating stuff. And uh, gives him this idea that perhaps the surface of the moon is not a crystalline sphere and not smooth at all, but it is bumpy, logically bumpy with mountains and valleys and plains. And he goes so far as to show a method of calculating their heights, which is fabulous. He uses <laughs> nothing more than the Pythagorean theorem um, where you've got the radius of the moon, you've got a mountain that has a height from A to D, and you've got the sun shining uh, from the right-hand side and the terminator line is FEC. So bright side of the moon's on the right, dark side on the left, but that mountain peak is being illuminated by sunlight. And so he can calculate the distances here just by using the Pythagorean theorem. He's not exactly accurate. He gets to a, a, a calculation of a few miles in altitude much higher than anything on earth that he knew of at the time. But still, um, he was really close. Later on, as, as this talk gets wrapped up, I'll show you a website where you can actually uh, look at the math, how it's done, and go try it yourself. After all, that, that's important. Um, he looks at Jupiter's moons. You can see on the left, photographs of the text. On the right, his notebook. Um, looking at the position of the moons changing with time, he knows that they're regular, that they're periodic. He doesn't know what they are. He still calls them stars. And in fact, Jupiter is still kind of an unknown. He, he can resolve it to a disk, but he can't see the cloud belts on it yet. So his optics were probably pretty horrible by today's standards, but he's making really good motion in the right direction. Stars, he sees so many stars, this is incredible. Back then, everything to them was a nebula. The Milky Way was a nebula. The head of Orion uh, was a nebula, it was a nebulous region. So was the precipice, the beehive in Cancer was a nebula. These are actual pages that fold out of Sidereus Nuncius. Beautiful, it surprised me because in the English translation, they don't fold out, they're just small little diagrams. These are complete fold outs um, of what he saw through his telescope oh, and, and also the Pleiades. And he makes note that rather than being nebulous and furry and fuzzy, that these things were actually comprised of hundreds if not thousands of stars that are now becoming visible and resolvable through his telescope, which dispels all sorts of issues, but it also creates new ones, of course. Fantastic observational skill is going on here. And I hear that later on in tonight's meeting, you'll be taking on a, a voyage through some of Galileo's um, selected deep sky objects. So I, I won't go into, into much more there. Um, but he had a great time trying to figure out how to map Orion. He wanted to map the whole constellation. And he, just, he got overwhelmed in the first 10 minutes and writes 
a few paragraphs about being overwhelmed by just how many stars there are, which is just logically sane, right? Um, the last thing you run into several times in this text is really, I would say, one of the earliest forms of grant writing, and it's certainly a wonderful one for um, the 17th century, 1610. Um, he names these things that are orbiting Jupiter, uh, the Medicean stars, and it's just great. This could be his ticket back to Tuscany. Um, he's, he's going to uh, implore the Grand Duke uh, by naming these things after uh, his, his kids, his four sons. So the Grand Duke, he describes as being Jupiter himself because Jupiter was actually in a, a primary spot when the Duke uh, was born. So this would be um, fantastically lucky. Um, <laughs> and then he names the rest of them the Medicean stars after his kids. Cosimo II de Medici um, had just become that Grand Duke. And so he's looking for some, some royalty here to help him out cash flow wise. Um, and he does so pretty well. Listen to this. This is just such great writing. Serenissimo Grand Duke, which Grand Sir, Grand Duke, scarcely have the immortal graces of your soul begun to shine forth on earth. Then bright stars offer themselves in the heavens, which like tongues longer lived than poets will speak of and celebrate your most excellent virtues for all time. Way to go, Galileo. That's beautiful. Now, if I put that in the grant request nowadays, um, <laughs> I don't think the NSF would give me a penny. They might smile a little bit and nod, but but there you go. This, this made him like highly desirable among the locals at the time. Within months of this being printed, this phraseology being printed. He was invited to the courts of the King of Spain, the Holy Roman Emperor, and the French ambassadors to Italy. Not bad, right? He was a household celebrity. Um, and within months after that, he was installed in Cosimo's court in Florence. Not bad. Not bad. But interestingly, we still call these moons the Galilean moons. But on a day-to-day -day basis, we know them as Eo, Ganymede, uh, Callisto, and Europa which had nothing to do with Galileo. It had to remember Simon Marius way back who had been observing them literally the next day in January and had at one point uh, tried to prove to people that he had observed them before Galileo. Well, it's kind of sad. Um, Simon Marius was using the old Julius calendar, the Julian calendar and Galileo was using the Gregorian. Uh, so they literally were just a day apart, um, but it was Simon Marius who observed them and gave them those four names, uh, Eo, Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto in Mundus Lovialis in 1614. And those names have stuck. So another interesting tidbit of history. The message. The book does have a message. It is indeed a message to astronomers. And maybe that is the way that the title should have been named after all. To quote Galileo in English, it remains for us to reveal and make known what appears to be most important in the present manner. Four planets never seen from the beginning of the world right up to our day, the occasion of their discovery and observation, their positions, and the observations made over the past two months concerning their behavior and changes. And I call on all astronomers to devote themselves to investigating and determining their periods. Because of the shortness of time, literally three months, it has not been possible for us, I love that, the royal we, to achieve this so far. We advise them again, however, that they will need a very accurate glass, like the one we have described at the beginning of this account, lest they undertake such an investigation in vain. So both a plea to go out and observe and figure out what's going on up there in the sky and to be careful and to do it with proper instrumentation. Remember, these instruments, these telescopes, this was the first time in history somebody had used an instrument, a mechanical device, in this case, an optical mechanical device, 
to observe the invisible and to make it visible. There was much at stake here. The proof that a scientific instrument could make the invisible visible was highly questionable at the time, even dangerous at the time. And that brings up like the very last slide. To continue looking at what happened with Galileo, and all of you know about the incidences of his being brought before the Inquisition, not once, but twice, and leading eventually to a 1633 house arrest. By the way, his house arrest, not a terrible thing when you're an aging individual going blind and have a very large villa with servants and uh, vineyard. Um, it, he hated it, so he said, but maybe he did. Maybe he did, but there are worse ways to be arrested by the Inquisition at the time. That's just a thought. Sedaris Nuncius, get a copy. It's a wonderful edition. This translated by Albert von Helden makes it much more readable. When I was a teenager and read it the first time, the translation was difficult. This is a very good one. It has over 50 pages of introductory notes and over 50 pages of end notes and all 57 pages of Galileo's work, including drawings. Um, definitely a worthy read. Galileo Galilei, um, the, the dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. Now this is the book that got him in trouble right here. This is a play, a discussion, a dialogue between two people, uh, one who is a learned philosopher type, Galileo, and one who is named Simplicio, simpleton, and then a uh, third individual who's kind of like the moderator of the discussion describing the two chief world systems. Is it heliocentric or geocentric? This is the book that got him in deep trouble by 1633. Highly recommend that you pick up a copy and read it. Um, this one's translated by a very famous Galileo translator, Stillman Drake, uh, it has a great introduction by Dale, J.L. Uh, Heilbrunn but it also has a really cool forward by somebody you might know, Albert Einstein, definitely a good read. And then lastly, if you're interested in some of the more esoteric stuff like Galileo's letters that go back and forth between royalty discussing things like sunspots and whatnot, this is uh, Discoveries and Opinions of Galileo, also translated by Stillman Drake, a fantastic uh, set of reads. There's, there's a lot in this. Um, and then very lastly, if you're curious about learning how to measure lunar mountain heights, go for it. This is what Galileo would want you to do, and I recommend it. It's an awful lot of fun. Um, go to that website on Galileo's lunar observations and measuring the mountain heights of the moon. Um, this is the simpler method that catches the moon earth sun system in a 90 degree position where the moon has a dichotomy, and you can look at mountain heights by by noting the ones that are illuminated on the edge of the terminator line. Um, there are more complicated methods if you are into calculating selenographic co-longitudes. Um, a little bit of trigonometry required, more so than just the simple Pythagorean theorem, but I'll leave that to you, all right? Um, that's what I have. I have consumed all 45 minutes. Um, I thank you for your time. John, that was awesome. Thank you, sir. Um, John, if you will stop your screen share, please, so we can see everybody. Thank you. So we do have some time carved out for just some general Q&A. Um, and again, I want to welcome everybody who's new here, our, our newer members, and also the general public. So everything is on the table for questions. These do not have to be advanced uh, astronomical questions. Uh, but we'd love to have anyone just step in, and you can put your questions in the chat. Um, or if you want to just raise your hand, well, I've got, I can't see everybody at once, so maybe the chat's best, uh, or just speak up. We'd love to hear from you and get in there. I know we already had one question during the presentation from Carl about who named the planets uh, in the 15 to 1600s. So, uh, John, you want to take that one? Who named the planets? Most of the planets already had names coming from antiquity, um, ancient Greek uh, leading up uh, through ancient Rome. Uh, so things like uh, Jupiter, uh, Saturn. They already knew about Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. So things like Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto uh, were named later by their discoverers like Herschel 
uh, Pluto was actually named by a young a young schoolgirl, if I recall the story of that correctly. Uh, I see Mark kind of nodding his head. Thank you, Mark. Um, so so <laughs> named by the astronomers who discovered them generally, with the exception of Neptune, which unfortunately, or, you know, there it is. <laughs> Cool. All right. Um, what other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Robert? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Hi. Hi, John. Hello. I was, um, my field was in just museum um, profession. The um, Sidereus, some 75 gra engravings maybe and drawings are in there. Did, did Galileo responsible for creating some of those drawings and Engravings? All, yes. Um, in Sidereus Nuncius, Galileo was responsible for, for the production of all of them, um, yeah. but in in close connection with the person who was doing the actual engraving work. Yeah. So, okay. so yeah. for example, um, <laughs> this is tough, uh, right? Because Galileo was doing was doing sketches with charcoal, right? Okay. And and the problem with the charcoal, and and he was also using uh, watercolor paint. So like sepia ink with brushes to do shaded work, yeah. he had to get somebody who could create these into boat into wood blocks and similar, um, mm -hmm. so that they could be mass printed. Yeah. Now, well, that yeah, how how large was the edition? Uh, how how, how many print, How many prints? Not yeah, many. Or, or no, how many um, pamphlets or? Not not many. Um, not many. We don't uh, know really. I, I estimated a couple hundred, but it was banned almost instantly. Yeah. <laughs> um, which which makes them not terribly rare, but really hard to get a good copy. Um, the Harvard has three of them. <laughs> it's like woo. -hoo! Um, go go check them out. Um, well, I'll, I'll pay more attention at the next flea market I go to. <laughs> <laughs> you let me know, okay? <laughs> okay, I'll show it to you. There, there, there is an important, um, there is an important thing to be said about this because there was actually a copy that went up for auction. Was it a couple of years ago that somebody was proposing had been actually hand painted by Galileo and was like the the first proof edition of the book, um, and that later turned out to be a forgery. Alas, <laughs> uh -huh. buyer beware. Yeah, exactly right. Buyer beware. Th thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Other questions or observations? I have one. Yes, Linda. Hi. Um, I'm trying to connect this to. I'm, I'm very fascinated by the planets and and these the star systems. And I understand. I also like mythology. And uh, I, I noticed that there are a lot of names of stars, you know, like Orion's Belt and the Pleiades. And they're, they're, I, I just want to know, and this may be off topic, but it's, it's interesting to know that there's a lot of mythology, um, you know, that, uh, that have something to do with the stars. Can you just sort of maybe make some connections there? Why is sure. that for us? Sure, there's an awful lot going on. Um, I have to remember going back um, thousands of years to the ancient Greeks and even, even before Babylonia, uh, getting back to Mesopotamia even, um, star systems have been carrying their names with them for many years. Um, one that you and, and all probably have heard of many times, even in recent history, because it's been doing some interesting variability. Betelgeuse, which is uh, the bright star in the upper left uh, mm -hmm. shoulder of Orion, the hunter classic. It's up there right now. It's a clear night. Um, <laughs> um, so Orion the Hunter, uh, Betelgeuse, really was a, a three-word uh, name, Betal Goiza, which means the joining of the hands of the two central ones. Now, who were the two central ones? Uh, long lost in recorded history, unfortunately, um, but pre-ancient pre Greece. And the name Betal Goiza or Betelgeuse comes from the ancient Arabic. Um, so those names, many of the names like Razalhag, um, Vindemiatrix, things like that, come from uh, Arabic names. Some of them come from Greek and then more modern from Latin. And then as we get into the more modern era, uh, have, been, have been renamed and their names been shortened, made easier to pronounce. Um, the constellations that you know, there are 88 official constellations that, that the IAU has recognized. And those are regions of the sky, but the ancients saw them as mythological figures and there are many stories from ancient Greece where people have been people heroes famous famous individuals have been like cast into the stars in the afterlife 
um, to live there permanently either uh, as, as a form of purgatory or, or some other such. There are some great books out there about this. Um, Star Names and Mythology, um, there are plenty of texts. And if you're interested, uh, do feel free to contact me. Um, I can give a whole bibliography of, of books that just look at star names. But there are a lot of really cool, um, there are a lot of cool just, just basic observatory manuals too. Um, there, there's some uh, hanging out in my bookshelf over there kind of buried are these, these books by people like Will Tyrion who are famous stellar cartographers and they have little star histories in them. Um, some of the Norton anthologies have got some, uh, some star name information in there as well. Burnham's Celestial Handbook, which is a, a multi-volume set. Uh, <laughs> I see Larry. Yep, I've got several copies of that. Um, and it, uh, largely forgotten and unloved, I guess, these days. But if you can get a copy of Burnham's Celestial Handbooks, they contain not only really valuable uh, observatory information for like going out and looking at the sky, but they also contain all the mythology, star names, all the history, delicious reading. In fact, the, probably the best story in there is about uh, the dog star Sirius and how back in ancient Egyptian times, it was a different color. A fantastic read so well thank you very much i'm very interested in sort of you know putting those two things together cool. thank you john there's a question on the chat from bailey cooper why was sidereus nuncius banned <laughs> yeah i questioned everything about the aristotelian universe <laughs> which which back then was um which was the driving force of of the church belief system in of the earth being a center of everything, that crystalline spheres were orbiting us when in fact the moon was bumpy and mountainous. Nobody, he, Galileo actually tried to show people of the time that the moon had mountains and valleys. All you have to do is look at it through a telescope, he'd say, and they would not believe him. They say, no, 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 it's perfectly crystalline and spherical and smooth. It, it could be no other way. So it challenged people's belief systems. Um, more than anything. And the very fact that there was more to be seen by this spyglass than was visible to the unaided eye was certainly also a mystery in terms of p basic knowledge. So epistemologically, Sidereus Nuncius was questioning our basic knowledge. Um, was the telescope evil? Was it transmogrifying what we were looking at and turning it into something um, that was devilish? Uh, it was banned, but more, more importantly, uh, Il Dialogo, the dialogue of the two chief world systems was banned even more immediately. By the way, Harvard has a copy of that as well, um, in good condition, though it has some redacted portions by the church back in the 1600s. Great stuff. Great stuff. Stephen, would you like to um, read your observation in the chat for the group? Oh, Stephen, we're not hearing you for some reason. Yeah, no, sorry. I was looking. I'm using my new iPad. I'm not an iPad person, so I'm trying to figure out where's the mute button on, the, on this right. one. Um, so yeah, I was just I just wanted to you know make an important note that you know cultures around the world in different parts. I mean, we're obviously very Western focused. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, but you know the uh, you know various cultures in North America, South America, you know Asia, you know they they all had their own constellations, their own mythologies that they you know projected onto the sky, and uh, some of those are very yes. interesting as well. Oh, they're they're delicious reading, they really are. Um, and if you've ever been to a truly dark sky site, you'll understand why um, the people of South America don't have constellations connecting the dots of the stars, but they actually use the dark nebulosity regions of the Milky Way as constellations. It's fascinating, it's really fascinating. Uh, a worthy study, if you're, if you're interested, I have lots of texts on, on that as well. Um, the, um, I see some other things there. Um, what evidence did people use for the Aristotelian model? Uh, largely uh, simplicity. Um, the fact that it goes back to Aristotle, then Cicero, and then all the way up to St. Thomas Aquinas, the orderly, the orderliness of it was very important. The fact that things could be described as being more perfect, the further you got away from the imperfections of the earth, air, fire, and water of, 
of uh, the surface of the earth and hell below us, Dante's Inferno. We also know the quintessence was out there toward the heavenly uh, firmament. Um, the fact that if the earth was moving, then things would fall off it. So logically we aren't moving. Um, but the idea that, that things could be orbiting other things that are orbiting, Jupiter, Jupiter's moons orbiting earth, um, really kind of cast doubt to all that, which was, which was interesting. Um, will the PowerPoint be posted? Um, certainly, I have no problem giving a, like a PDF copy of that. Uh, Wyatt, you just email me later, we'll figure out how to make that happen. Cool. All right, other questions? Thoughts, observations? Would you make a list of those books that you had mentioned earlier, please? Um, so I, so I can't text it really fast to myself. Those books that you were talking about. Sure, um, Linda. You know what? I'll put those in the bibliographical section at the end of this PowerPoint. Okay. Thank you very I'll just, much. I'll just do a last minute edit and I'll send it off to Wyatt. Thank you. And, and Paola, hello again, Paola. Good to see Hi. you. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Welcome. Um, yeah, we'll see what we can do. I'd never heard that either, John. Yeah, I'm really interested. But actually, I have another question, and this might be a little, little off topic. But I was just, I was very curious about sort of like these optic, optical inventions that kind of happened, and if maybe you could suggest a book. I'm very interested in sort of um, how the evolution of the of the telescope, microscope, glasses. Like, when did we begin to use all these to? to augment our our vision and um i'd be very interested to hear all these because i'm just fascinated by you know i was i was thinking right now of um of how how these all sort of just um how they overlapped and well, ha um, happy to help yeah i can throw yeah, yeah. In, in there too uh, the biblical thank you so much not a problem thank you and paolo yeah paola paola yes paola yes nice to meet you nice to meet you as well son all right. Okay. Well, thank you, people. It's been fun. Yeah, it's been thank a while, you. That, so. was, that was absolutely awesome. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Right. So um, now, so that we can all follow in Galileo's footsteps, let's do um, a quick deep sky observation uh, tour with Galileo. I put the, together this observing guide, and I'll e email this out to the membership. Uh, and anybody who's a guest tonight, if you're interested in getting this, my email is going to be at the bottom of this, president at nhastro.com, but just email me, I'll send it to you. We'll also make sure you get a copy of John's presentation. Um, but I want to just give you quick resources uh, and then some orientation, and then we'll look at some of these things here um, on the computer and kind of see where you're going to find them. So the first thing I want to point out to you is that there are many um, examples like this, but here is a star chart that you can go and get. Um, and you can do a printer-friendly version of this. And this contains all of the objects that are in Galileo's deep sky uh, Sidereus Nuncius list, if you will, uh, including the constellation Orion, which we're gonna talk about here in just a second, located right here. Um, the Pleiades star cluster, which we're gonna talk about right here. Uh, the beehive or Presepi uh, cluster over here, M44, uh, and several objects in Orion Sword. So when you get the guide, if you don't have your own tools, here's a free one. Uh, and it shows you the sky as you might see it later tonight uh, in any part of the United States, uh, looking to the south for our objects. So I suggest that you go out about nine o'clock uh, tonight and even throughout the month of January, look to the south. Um, you might want to have a print of that sky map or perhaps an app if you're interested. There are many different apps that are on um, cell phones that work great. Um, if you use the print map, take a red flashlight so your eyes can adapt and you can see a little bit better uh, with your night vision out there under the stars. So the first thing we're gonna do and I'm just going to track this back to Sidereus Nuncius itself, um, is to look kind of blow by blow. And John, one of the comments that you pulled out was the one, one of the ones that I'd highlighted about how Galileo had set out to chart the entirety of Orion, but quickly yes, found it out, it's like, hang on a second, there, there are hundreds of stars here, right? Yep. So he decided to quote unquote simplify it. Um, but here is an example of one of those engravings. 
And if you look closely, you see three major stars right here, which would be Orion's belt. And then you see stars coming down this way, which would be Orion's sword. Um, if we take this now and we come over to a live planetarium view of this, we could come to Orion right here. And let me just center this for you. Uh, and again, you'll be looking to the south, southeast, and at about nine o'clock at night, you'll be looking up about 45 degrees or so above the horizon. If you're way down in Texas, um, I guess it'll look, be a little bit higher than that, maybe 55 degrees up. But if we start to come in and get a little bit closer, you can see those three same major stars and the stars of the belt coming down this way. And this big blue circle, by the way, is approximately the field of view that you might have through a modern, very simple set of binoculars um, that might give you something like 10x. So if we look in that first piece, let me take you back to the guide. Um, there are a couple of things here that show up that are actually modern named star clusters and nebulae uh, that are on Galileo's original chart. One is NGC 1980. NGC stands for New General Catalog. It's an open star cluster, and it would be illustrated down in this area on Galileo's engraving. We can come in a little bit closer down here and see NGC 1980 right here in the Sword of Orion. And if we go in like you might see it from your naked eye view uh, at night, if your eyes are adapted and you're away from light a little bit, you'll see a kind of a glowing area in this, in this sword. If you take a set of home, of home binoculars, just simple binoculars, you start to get this kind of view. And you can begin to see this very bright cluster of stars here. And so that's one of the original things that he observed. If you come right up the Sword of Orion, one of the next things that's up here uh, that's really interesting and fun to see would be M42, which is the Great Orion Nebula. Uh, again, just with the naked eye, you can see a bright glow in the Sword of Orion. That's the nebula. If you come in with a pair of binoculars, you start to see this kind of view where you see this nebulosity, and this is basically an area of intense star formation. Uh, if you happen to have a small telescope, and it can be a very simple telescope, you might have a field of view that's more like this and start to see some really interesting things popping out in this area, like some very bright double stars. Um, and coming back up into the nebula itself, even seeing some very famous multi-star systems like the trapezium, for example. So all of these things are easily viewable uh, in a small telescope just from your backyard. Let's keep going quickly. Uh, if you come on up the Sword of Orion, you'll come to another star cluster, which is illustrated in Galileo's engravings, uh, right about here. And this is NGC 1981, um, easily observed with a set of binoculars as a very bright grouping of stars right here. And again, with a small telescope, if you were to center this uh, and put a little bit more magnification on it, you would start to get a view that looks like this. Uh, I think this is, I can't remember what this, the popular name is, but it almost looks like a, like a running man or something like that. You can make up your own idea about what it looks like, but it's just a scattering of stars. I'm going to take you quickly up to the head of Orion, and this is one of the specific things that's referenced in Sidereus Nuncius. Um, Galileo talks about the nebula of Orion, quote unquote, and illustrates it this way. Today, in modern terms, it is a star cluster uh, referred to as Colander 69. It's up above the two bright cornerstones of Orion and the nebula, uh, and it is a very broad, loose uh, star cluster. So it will look like a, a broad spray of stars in a, in a telescope. Actually, not particularly uh, awesome compared to the, to the belt of Orion. But one kind of interesting thing for those of you that do have a small telescope, if you go in a little bit further, you start to see more details on the stars, but if you crank up the magnification just a little bit more, this one star right here in the middle is actually a very beautiful double star uh, that you can, you can make out when you apply higher magnification. So that's just one thing to look at. My favorite engraving from all of Sidereus Nuncius is that of the Pleiades, uh, and it is right here. Um, and so I think that many of you may be familiar with the Pleiades if you've ever seen uh, the logo of a Subaru. Uh, the logos of Subarus are the Pleiades. If you ever see the Pleiades traveling towards you at a rapid rate of speed, you should get out of the road. That's a joke. Um, let's go there. The Pleiades are up here to the south, high in the sky. 
very small, very bright. They almost look like a kite. So when we come in here, you'll see them with your naked eye. If you come in with binoculars, they're absolutely gorgeous. One of the most beautiful star clusters out there, in my opinion. Very bright white stars. You'll notice this nebulosity that's illustrated on the computer screen. Um, as you get closer to these, and if you have good dark sky, you can make out that nebulosity. And with a small telescope, again, you can come in and see immense detail. These beautiful chains of stars, double stars, nebulosity, one of the most amazing star clusters out there. So a neat object to check out for sure. One last one quickly, which is M44, the beehive cluster. And this is what Galileo refers to as the nebula of Presepe right here. Um, this is a very large star cluster that's actually located a little bit to the east of all of these locations. Over here, it's gonna be low in the horizon in the east tonight, uh, if you're interested to see this. On a dark night, you will see this um, with your naked eye. And it's actually kind of hard to see in a telescope because it is so large. But if we come in here, with binoculars, uh, it's a very beautiful, very broad spray of stars and easy to see and really a lot of fun. So that's just a quick view, a, a tour guide for you. Anybody can do this with your naked eye, with binoculars from home, with a small telescope. And for those of you that do, if you wanna log your observations, email them to me and we'll send you an NHS observing certificate. So that's the quick tour. Um, and again, for any of you who aren't members, uh, if you want to just email me, president at NHAS or nhastro.com, I'll be glad to send that to you. All right. How many of you have actually done that, that list before? Show of hands. Oh, Robert. <laughs> Good. All right. I encourage you to give it a try. And then, you know, the moon, measuring the mountains of the moon, that's a, that's a completely different challenge I've never thought of, John, but apparently highly recommended. So we'll, we'll try that one next. Okay, um, John, thanks again for joining us. Great presentation. Um, let's go ahead and shift gears. I wanna cover for everybody uh, and for our new members, uh, for our guests tonight, several of the resources that we have as the Astronomical Society for what we'll call aspiring um, astronomers. So the first thing that's coming up, and this is something that we haven't done before in the pandemic era, is we're taking some of our traditional programming, which would involve getting together, setting up telescopes and talking about observing, uh, talking about using telescopes and binoculars, and we're gonna take it online. Uh, so here at the end of January, we're launching something called Visual Observing Shop Talk. And this is available to members. Uh, and this is going to be in a format just like what you see tonight, but we're gonna be using some broader scope webcams, setting up some basic telescopes, using some binoculars and just talking about anything that comes up. And I really wanna underscore that there's no topic that's uh, too basic in this conversation and there's no topic that's too advanced, but we've already got a commitment from several of our really experienced observers in the society to join in on this. And we're gonna moderate this conversation, but this will be a chance to just set up and talk about anything that has to do with using these optics you know, that Galileo was talking about. And in our modern sense, that are so broadly available uh, and applying them to the kinds of observation lists we just talked about. Uh, it's talking about observations that members are making out there and learning how to become be better visual observers. So I hope everybody will put that on their calendar. I think it's gonna be really informative. Um, and we're gonna look to see about doing that ongoing in the future so we can continue to share information back and forth. Um, and as the pandemic debates, we're gonna try to do a lot more of this in person, but I imagine we'll continue to do it online as well, uh, just so we can share it out there. I do wanna point out that there are several other things here and I would, we have to, to mention the library telescope program, not as a cool program, and I'm actually gonna bring that up here in a second, <clears throat> but as a primary resource. Uh, to our members. And so you're able to go to, I'll show you here, many libraries in the state um, and find one of these, uh, a four and a half inch Newtonian reflector that we've put in, in many, many libraries across the state. And I actually have here, not that it'll be perfectly precise, but here's a map of all those different scopes across the state. One of them has migrated to Maine, uh, we notice, but I guess we'll, we'll go with that. 
Uh, but the point is that these libraries are all over the state. I actually asked our librarian here in Rye uh, last week, how often does someone check out that scope? And it turns out very frequently. And so these are available to you. And then again, back to that idea that you have club members all around you. We have a mentor program. Uh, so if you want to learn more about how to use the telescope or you're struggling with some aspect of it, that's a great thing to do. Um, we also have our loaner telescope program. And I'd like to put this up for you really quickly. Um, these are a series of telescopes that are include the library telescope model that you can check out for up to two months at a time through the New Hampshire Astronomical Society and use. We have a solar telescope. We have- Wyatt are, you, Wyatt, are you sharing your screen right now? I thought I was, am I not? I'm not well, seeing I'm it. seeing everybody, which is a lot of fun, but <laughs> not quite as well. well there oh, we go. So now much we better. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Know. Sorry about that. I thought I had shared it. So here, here are the different scopes that you can actually get through the club as loan scopes for up to two months. We have the library telescope here. Uh, we have a solar telescope, and then we have a series of uh, Newtonian Dobsonian telescopes that go from six inches to 10 inches. So these are great scopes. I actually own one of these six inch scopes here. It's a fantastic telescope, uh, but encourage the members to you know, make use of these resources. And again, to feel comfortable reaching out to other members of the club uh, and you know, getting help with how to apply them and how to become better observers overall. Let me see here. I do want to point out, actually, back to the library telescope program, if I may, uh, just for a moment, that we did receive an announcement from one of our members, or about one of our members, just came out in the Reflector, which is the magazine of the Astronomical League for the United States. Um, and we have, um, let me put this up for you here real quick. Mark Strobridge, who is a member of New Hampshire Astronomical Society, who actually launched the idea of the Library Telescope Program in New Hampshire from the Astronomical Society here. This program has since been taken on by the Astronomical League and, and promulgated throughout the United States, throughout the world. And Mark was just recognized for his work there. So if we may, a, a round of applause for Mark. It's really an amazing program. Um, it's reached thousands of people. Uh, and it's just a, a wonderful example of the kind of outreach that the society does. So I want to point up that for Mark and Mark, congratulations on the work there. So that's just a quick roundup of the opportunities that are out there, resources for folks who are coming along as astronomers, as observers. And I want to keep underscoring that a full third of our membership considers themselves to be beginners. And so it's really an opportunity for us to get together and all learn as we move forward uh, as visual observers. Last thing quickly before we go over to club business, I wanna talk about the upcoming Astronomical Society events. And again, and invite uh, the guests that we have tonight to consider joining us in the future. Um, at the beginning of February, we're gonna do a virtual tour of, of skies. And so it'll be very much like that observing guide we just did, but much more expanded about what's up there that's interesting to look at uh, in February in the wintertime skies in New Hampshire and across the United States. I mentioned earlier that we have Sally Jansen coming in to do the, uh, the speaker series presentation for February on the Perseverance rover mission to Mars. And Sally, I've already looked at some of the materials that, that you've got out there and it's just really amazing stuff. Uh, and Sally is a NASA solar system ambassador and is really gonna take us through that. And it's extremely timely because as we mentioned, uh, we're gonna have a rover landing here later in February. So it'll be an interesting topic. In March, we've already got an amazing speaker booked. I don't know how many of you've heard of Rod Melise. Um, Rod does not look like John. I'm just gonna give you a little bit of an alternative view here. There's Rod. Uh, down in the South, a very colorful character, but John, as you, if you know about Rod. I know Rod, <laughs> he and I are often confused. <laughs> <laughs> I, I even have that hat, no for joke. For obvious I... reasons, for obvious reasons, yeah. Uh, Rod's a character, he is an amazing visual observer uh, and he's an amazing astronomy educator. He's written one of the most important books in my astronomy education, which is Urban Astronomy. 
and it's how to use amateur telescopes successfully from the city or from the suburbs, not from extremely dark sites, although you certainly can. But Rod's just a fantastic presenter. I think it's going to be really interesting. So we've got Rod coming in. I welcome your ideas, by the way, for future presenters and topics. So please feel free to reach out to me and let me know what you're thinking. We're working on this now. We've got some really interesting connections to the leadership at Sky and Telescope Magazine, who in turn have really interesting connections to a really broad swath of great experts across the world. So we're working to bring those folks in and I'd love to know what is interesting to you. Are there any other events that anyone would like to bring up while we have this topic up? Any events or uh, questions? I'm, I'm, I'm so new. Yeah, I have, a, I have a, um, a Newtonian reflector telescope and I wanna know a couple things. Um, I saw you had an app or something. I don't know what app to use on my phone that'll help me point my telescope into areas like, you know, I want to look at galaxies and, you know, nebulas and such. And can you give me an idea about apps? Sure, there are many and I'll, I'll open this up. I'm sure a lot of folks have ideas out there. There's already on the chat, um, Sky Safari, which was the actual computer program I was using earlier. I'm using it on a Mac. Uh, but it is available for iPhone and Android as an app. And the basic version, I think, is maybe $2. Yeah, I'm looking at it. I, I'd like type it in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, it's, and it's excellent. And there are others out there like that, but that would be a, a, a really good one, uh, potentially. Okay. Yeah. And Carl well, try Sky Portal. It's a free app by Celestron. And it's free because you can use it to run their telescopes. Um, but it's the same as Sky Safari. I believe it um, is. And it's very intuitive. I, uh, this may be heretical, but I, it, it's easier for me to use than uh, Stellarium, which is another one. Good. Lynn, does that help, Linda? Yeah. Well, what did you call it? Sky? What was the other one? Sky what? Sky Portal. 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 OK. And um, <clears throat> also um, Stellarium, and don't ask me to spell that. <laughs> but something else you might find useful as I think of it is, um, uh, oh gosh, um, uh, Virtual Moon Atlas. Yep. Okay. That has more information about everything you can see on the moon than you will ever, ever want to know. Um, yep. The Thank Sky you. Portal, by the way, is really nice when working with kids because it has an audio feature. So instead of relying on, you know, an eighth or ninth grade reading reading level, they can listen to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank All you right. very much. And Linda, these are good examples of the kinds of things we're going to do in the shop talk as well. Yeah. So I hope yeah. you'll hope you'll join us. Yeah, and we'll. we'll yeah, Calendar. <laughs> Good. We'll, we'll drill into all of that and a whole lot more. So look yeah, thank you. Because it's just been sitting in my sunroom and I'm like, I, I looked at the moon and I'm like, okay, I know that one. But I mean, you know, <laughs> What's I kind of want to move along a little bit more than that. Right. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Remarkably, we're right on agenda, which is amazing. Um, we're going to shift gears to club business. Before we do, and especially for our guests, I am going to make an ask, and that is, uh, if you haven't joined us yet, please consider doing so. Uh, we're going to be doing this kind of programming. Uh, we're going to get together online to talk about astronomy, talk about observing. As the pandemic abates, we're going to do a lot more up at our dark sky site in southwestern New Hampshire, the Young Farm Observing um, Site, which is an amazing asset. We have 16 and 14 inch telescopes up there in a formal observatory. And so we'll be getting there. Uh, and the other thing I really want to point out is your membership and your support help us do things like the library telescope program and like public outreach all over the state and increasingly with our online work all over the world. Uh, so we're able to reach kids in schools and uh, adults who are interested and connect people. And we think this is just really important work to advance amateur astronomy, to advance science and love of the stars. So hope that you'll consider joining us. All right, um, let's shift gears to club business.